Okay, so today we learn a fourth method. <clears throat> Every method so far that we've studied, the, the plurality method, the board account method, and the plurality with elimination method, all of them can sometimes violate the Condorcet criterion. Okay, so as, as we were working through, we did an example for each of them that violated Condorcet. Okay, which means that it's possible for someone to win all their head-to-head -head matchups and lose in all three of those methods. So we are going to devise a method that will always satisfy Condorcet. So if someone wins their head-to-heads, they will win this method. So the way we create the method is we do all the head-to-head -head matchups. Okay, so every candidate is matched head-to-head head -to -head against every other candidate. And the winner of each matchup gets a point. In the case of a tie, each candidate gets half a point. And after all the matchups are complete, you tally the points, and the one with the most is declared the winner. So we'll go through an example so you can see it in action. So same election that we've been doing before. Um, we've used this in the other three methods, and I think we've had three different winners, um, A, B, and D. I think, from our three winners. All right, so if I want to do pairwise comparisons, first I need to list all the possible matchups. Okay, so I have four candidates, A, B, C, and D. I have to write out all the matchups. So I can compare A against B, A matched against C, and A matched against D. Is there anyone else that A could go up against? Nope, that's it. Those are all the candidates. So now I'm going to do B's matchups. So that's all of A's matchups. So now I have to do B against C. Why not A? Already matched B against A, right? They already are competing against A. So I'm going to do B against C and B against D. And now I have to do C's matchups. I've already done C against A up here. I've already done C against B. So I just need to do C against D. And then D's matchups are all done now. I have D against A, D against B, and D against C. So there are six total matchups here. Now I have to find out who wins each one. So I go back to the preference schedule, and I have to decide if A and B were the only choices, who would win this election? OK, so these 14 people, if they had to choose between A and B, who would they choose? A. So we'll give A 14 here. And these 10 people, if they had to choose between A and B, who would they choose? B, because they have B ranked above A. Yep, B is ranked higher than A, so they would choose B. These eight people, who would they choose? B. They have B ranked above A here, so B has another eight. And these four would choose B. And this last one lone voter would choose B. Yep. So we put another one vote under B. And B is definitely going to win. Right? So B wins that matchup. Now A against C. We have to do it all over again, pretending A and C are the only candidates, and we have to decide who each voter would choose based on their preference. So these 14 votes, if they had to choose between A and C, who would they pick? They have A ranked above C, so they would pick A. So we give 14 votes to A. These 10 people, who would they pick? C, because they have C ranked above A. And these 8, C. And these 4, C. And the last one, C. Because everyone but the first 14 has A in last place, all the rest of the votes are going to go to the other candidate. So that makes C the winner. And here, D, the same thing is going to happen with D. It's going to be the same score because A will get these 14 and none of the rest because A is always in last place. 
All right, so now I have to match up B against C. B against C. So first 14 voters, would they choose B or C? B. 14 for B. Okay. The next 10, B or C? C, because they have C ranked above B. So I put 10 here. The next 8, B or C? C. C is ranked above B, so 8 more votes go to C. And the next four, B or C? B. And the last voter? C. So that makes C the winner, 19 to 18. Okay, B against D. These 14 voters, who would they choose, B or D? B. So 14, the next 10, B or D? D, yep. Then the next eight, D, they have D ranked above B, so we've got eight. And then the next four, B, yep. And the last voter, D. So that makes B the winner. B has more votes than D. Okay, so for C against D, last matchup. The first 14, who would they choose, C or D? C. Next 10, C or D? C. Next 8, C or D? D. And then the 4, D. And the 1, C. So I have 4 and 1. That makes C the winner. Oh, was it opposite? Sorry. Yeah, C still has the most. So then we tally up who who won the most matchups. So we look A won zero matchups, right? B won one, this one, and two, that one. C won this one. And this one and this one. So C has three matchups. And D won this one. And that's it. So we would declare the winner of this election to be candidate C, winning the most head to head matchups. Now, candidate C, did they win all of their head to head matchups? Nobody beat C. Nobody beat them. So what does that make candidate C? Condorcet. It's a Condorcet. So in this method, it would be impossible for someone to win all their matchups and not win the election. So if you win them all, you're going to have the most. Okay. So it's not required to win them all to win this method, but if you do win them all, you will definitely win. So if a candidate received a majority of the votes, would they win using pairwise comparisons? Someone has 51 out of 100 votes. Would they win using pairwise comparisons? Yes, 51 first place votes. Yeah, the most anyone else could get is 49. Yes. 
<laughs> Would they be Condorcet? If somebody has a majority of the votes, does that make them a Condorcet candidate? Yeah, can you explain why? Why does that mean that they'll win all their head-to-head -head matchups? Because if they're in Forbes place with the majority, then they have to be, um, like, Yeah, so if there are 100 votes to be had, and candidate A has 51 of them, 51 first place votes, if you match them up head-to-head -head against anyone else, the most that other person could have is 49 votes. So there's no way they're going to lose a head-to-head -head matchup. Because the rest of the 49 votes are split among however many candidates there are. So a majority candidate is automatically Condorcet. Yeah? What do you think? I feel like if there were enough rounds of voting, then eventually the majority would matter so much. What do you mean by rounds? Because there aren't rounds in this particular method. Ah, okay. So you're, if there were more candidates or more voters or... Like how you got 14 in the first round and 10 in the second round. Okay, these aren't rounds. Yeah, so these aren't rounds. These are um, numbers of voters. So 14 people ranked the candidates A, B, C, D, and 10 people ranked them C, B, D, A. It wasn't that we voted one, you know, so many times. This is ju the re just like piles of ballots. Right. No. So if you have a majority of the votes, you will automatically be Condorcet. Nobody could beat you in a head-to-head -head matchup if you have more than half the votes. Okay. And if you're a Condorcet candidate, can you lose the method of pairwise comparisons? No. Yeah, you'd, you'd be an automatic, you're an automatic winner. Yep. This, we designed the method of pairwise comparisons to satisfy the Condorcet criterion. Yes, if you have a majority, you automatically win plurality. Yes. Yep. So if you are, but if you're Condorcet, you don't automatically win plurality because if you're a majority candidate, you're automatically a Condorcet candidate, but the reverse doesn't work. You can be a Condorcet candidate without having a majority. That's okay. No, it's it's very different from board account. We did all the head-to-head -head matchups for winning a matchup. Okay. Yeah. So you tally the votes. Like here I did A against B. And I said A would get 14 and B would get the rest of the votes. So B wins that matchup. B gets one point for that matchup. Yeah. So if a majority candidate is automatically Condorcet and a Condorcet candidate automatically wins pairwise comparisons, then we will always satisfy the Condorcet criterion with this method. Pairwise comparisons always satisfies Condorcet criterion. That is, it is impossible for someone to be a Condorcet candidate and lose. It is also impossible for someone to be a majority candidate and lose. Because if you're a majority candidate, you're automatically Condorcet. So it always satisfies the Condorcet criterion and the majority criterion.
So two of our, our most basic fairness criteria are satisfied now. So it seems like a pretty fair method. Any questions on how it works? Uh, so yes, we just talked about this. We always satisfy Condorcet. Now, what if um, candidate X wins using this method and in a re-election, some voters decide to put candidate X higher in their preference schedule? Would candidate X still win the election? Yes, yeah. Because remember, that was a weird thing that could happen with plurality with elimination. You could rank someone higher in a second vote, and they could end up losing. I don't think that that can happen in this method, because if you give someone more votes, it's only going to help them win head-to-head -head matchups. Can't hurt you. So yes, the candidate would still win, which tells us that pair, uh, pairwise comparisons always satisfies the monotonicity criterion. So we have a method that satisfies all three of the fairness criteria that we know about. Okay. Our other three methods thus far have violated one of them, or can sometimes. That is such a good question. Why don't we just do this one? Does it have any drawbacks? Of course. Of course. So this method um, satisfies all three of our fairness criteria. Yes, right? But let's look at another example before we get too excited. So we have a pro football team. They're getting the number one pick in the upcoming draft. And the team has narrowed down their candidates to five players, Allen Byers, Castillo, Dixon, and Evans. So team rules state that the final choice is made by the method of pairwise comparisons. And this is a preference schedule of the votes cast by coaches, scouts, and team executives. So in your groups, I want you to carry out the method of pairwise comparisons and determine the winner of this election. Okay, so I'm not going to go through all the tallying, but we'll just quickly make sure that we all agree who wins the various matchups. A versus C, who wins the matchup? A. Okay. A versus D? Everybody agree? Okay. A versus E? A. Okay. Um, B versus C? B versus D? Tie. tie. Uh, I'll do that to, to indicate a tie. B versus E? C versus D? C versus E? And D versus E? All right, good. So it looks like A has a total of one, two, three wins. B has a half, one, two, 2.5. C has three. Yep, I think that's right. C against E. E is actually the winner. C versus E. E wins. Okay, let's let's do C versus E. These two, C versus E, would choose C. These six, C versus E, would choose C. These four would choose E. This one would choose C. This one would choose C. These four would choose E. And these four would choose E. So E has 12, C has 10. 
So E wins that matchup. So that means that C wins two matchups. D wins one and a half. And E once. So A is going to be the winner of this election with three points, winning three head to head matchups. So Alan's our guy, right? We want Alan. We're gonna that's who we want to draft. Right before the draft, we discover Castillo's been accepted to medical school. He's not gonna play pro football. He's not our choice though. We don't care, right? We want Alan. Alan's our guy. So Castillo drops out. Who cares? We didn't want him anyway. Seems like it shouldn't make a difference, right? Yeah, so we're gonna move everybody else up in the preference schedule. So if you look at this preference schedule, I'm going to copy it onto the next slide here. So we're going to create a new preference schedule that's going to eliminate C and move any player that's below C up a slot. So my new preference schedule is going to look like A, D, get rid of C, B, E. So you can just go like that. And then we're going to have B, A, D, E. And then B, A, D, E, just get rid of C. So here we're going to get rid of C, and we're going to have B, A, D, E. So you could do this with just scratching out. You might want to build a new one because this is gets pretty messy. Right? Yes, right, Because and now I can combine columns. So maybe I'll, I'll finish scratching out, and then I'll build a new one where I combine columns. So I get rid of C, move everyone else up. So I have D, A, B, E. And D, A, E, get rid of C, replace it with B. D, B, A. So my new preference schedule, I have A, D, B, E. Any other A, D, B, E's? Nope. So I'm going to have two A, D, B, E's. Then I have B, A, D, E. I have six of those plus four more plus one more. The six, the four, and the one after you get rid of C all have B, A, D, E. So I'm going to have 11 B, A, D, E's. Then I have D, A, B, E's, and I only have one of those. four DAEBs and four EDBAs. So there's our new preference schedule with only four candidates in it. I want you in your groups, write out all the matchups and determine the winner now that Castillo is gone. Do pairwise comparisons again. Okay, here are our six matchups. A versus, a versus B, A versus D, A versus E, B versus D, B versus E, and D versus E. So, A versus B, who would win? B. A versus D? A versus E. B versus D. Tie. B versus E. What? B. Okay. D versus E. Okay. So A has one, two matchups. Um, B has. One, two and a half. 
uh, there is no C. He's gone. D has 1.5, and E has zero. Okay, so who wins this? Who wins the head-to-head -head matchups now? B. So we now we want player B. Just because Castillo's gone, we changed our mind, and now we want somebody else. That's weird. Isn't that weird? We wanted Allen, and now we want Byers. Only thing that changed is that Castillo, somebody we didn't want anyway, left. Yeah, but all his votes are going to go to somebody else, so it so it throws it makes everything seem a little weird. Okay, so it seems like an odd result. It illustrates that the method of pairwise comparisons violates a new fairness criteria. It's called the independent of irrelevant alternatives, also known as IIA, also known as the dropout criterion. It says that if candidate X is a winner, and in a recount, one of the non-winning candidate withdraws or is disqualified, then X should still win. So if, imagine you're in an election. You win. You've been declared the winner. And then you know, a couple days later, it comes out that one of your opponents uh, cheated and is disqualified. Shouldn't matter. You should still win, right? But with the method... Well, yeah, sure. Hypothetically, we find out a couple days later that that candidate cheated. If they re-tally all the votes, you should still win. Right. If they re-tally all the votes with that candidate now disqualified, you should still win. Shouldn't matter. They lost, right? But it turns out that sometimes, with the method of pairwise comparisons, it can be that you would be the winner, we disqualify this other person, recount the votes, and now you no longer win. So we have this, this drawback to the method of pairwise comparisons. So this next example illustrates another drawback. So in your groups, I want you to determine the winner of this election um, for the hockey team deciding where to eat lunch. Use the pairwise comparisons to determine the winner. OK, so uh, people seem to be finishing up here. So. We can do these three methods fairly quickly, I think. Um, first method, pairwise comparisons. So we have three matchups, A against B, A against C, and B against C. So who wins A against B? A would have 4 plus 6 is 10, and the remaining 5 would go to B. So A wins. A against C, who wins? C and B against C? B. Okay, so we have A has one vote, B has one vote, and C has one vote. So we have a three-way tie. Three-way tie. So that's a drawback of pairwise comparisons. It's easy to tie. So you have to have some method in place ahead of time on how you're going to determine a tiebreaker. And then we want to determine the winner using uh, each of the following. Plurality. Okay, so who has the most first place votes here? C, C has six first place votes, B has five, and A has four. A four, B five, C six, C wins. Okay. Board account, we got to do the points thing. Okay, so A is going to have 32. OK, yeah, you can just tell me. A has 32. B has 29. C also has 29. So A wins using board account. And plurality with elimination, you start with plurality, right? You say A has 4, B has 5. And C has six. Does anyone have a majority? Six. Nope. Because there are 15 voters. So how many would you need for a majority? Eight. 
because for a majority you need more than half, yeah. So you need eight votes for a majority, nobody has a majority, so who do we eliminate? A, yep, we eliminate A, and then we look at the preference schedule to decide who those votes should go to. So the four people who voted for A, we're going to give their votes to B because they're next in line on the preference schedule of those four people. Okay. So those votes are going to go to B. So plus four. So B now has nine votes. Is that a majority? Yes. Okay, so B is the winner. So great. That didn't really help. We did the four different methods. One gave a tie and the other three gave three different winners. So what's the point of voting, right? <laughs> so can, what can we conclude? What do you think about voting? Voting can be rigged. Okay. That's a good one. Yeah, you need to decide on a method ahead of time. <laughs> yep, results from voting can be inconclusive. Or unfair, right? It's possible to have a result that just seems totally unfair. <laughs> so part of what we want to discover through this this unit on voting is that um, you know it's there's it's a lot more complicated than than we are led to believe as we are raised in a democracy. There's a lot more issues of fairness um, than we ever think about. So there is one final drawback to the method of pairwise comparisons. So we already have two. It can violate a fairness, a new fairness criterion called independent of irrelevant alternatives or the dropout criterion. It can easily result in a tie. And we have a third one, and that is that as the number of candidates grows, the number of comparisons you have to do grows. So with 10 candidates, there are 45 comparisons. And 100 candidates, there are 4,950 head-to-head -head matchups, which is a lot, right? So how do we figure out how many comparisons have to be made? They actually like, do that and that um, Well, it, it might be that people who are deciding what kind of method to use would say, well, if it's possible that you're going to get a lot of candidates, maybe you rule this method out and say this is too difficult for us. Yes. Who uses this? Um, yeah. Yes. Mm hmm Yeah, that's a great question. I'll I'll try to I'll come up with an example for you for next class. I'll do a little re I'll do a little research and find out. So, the question is how how do we know ahead of time how many comparisons there are going to be without having to try to list them all? Okay, so we're going to start with a, a seemingly unrelated question. I want to add up all the whole numbers from one to ninety nine. I want to know the answer to this addition problem. Yep. 9,999? No. No, I'm a little off. <laughs> no. no. We've got 99 plus 1 is 100. 98 plus 2 is 100. 97 plus 3 is 100. Uh-huh. 49 equals 49. 
So you know 99 is the end. 50 times 49. That's a great observation. So this, this is actually a really famous um, anecdote about a mathematician named Gauss, probably one of the most brilliant, famous mathematicians ever. There's this anecdote about him as an elementary school student uh, acting out in class and his teacher telling him to go sit in the corner and add all the numbers from 1 to 100 or 1 to 1,000. I can't remember what, what it was. And he did it in like 30 seconds and had the answer. And he made that exact observation. He said, well, the 1 and the 99 make a 100. The 2 and the 98 make a 100. The 3 and the 97 make a 100. And you keep doing that till you get to the middle, right? So the last two things you're going to be adding are what? 50 and 49. No, that's... Yeah. 49 and 51. You add the 49 and the 51. You have an extra 50. The the 50 that is the 50 right in the middle. Yeah, you have an extra 50. How many 100s do we have there? Well, I wrote four, but there's some dot. There's some missing, right? I put dot dot dot. 49. Yeah. So the one with the 99, the two with the 98, the three with the 97. Yeah, so I have 49 100s that I'm adding up there. How do you add 100 to itself 49 times? Multiply. This is 100 times 49. Then there's the 50 in the middle. So I get 49 50 is the answer. 4,950. So... The tricky part of this problem for me is deciding how many 100s am I going to be adding up and do I have an do I have a leftover, right? Is there a number in the middle that didn't get a pair? Okay, so that's that's what makes it a little bit tricky. So I'm just going to show you another way to solve this problem. Okay, so I want to add up 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus I'm going to say that has to add up to something, and I'm going to call it x. Now, if you add numbers forwards or backwards, you get the same sum, right? Whether you start with the front of the list or the end of the list. So if I add up 99 plus 98 plus 97 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1, I should also get x. So now I'm going to use a little trick from algebra that if you have two equations, you can add them together. Does that sound familiar? Add these two equations together. I have 1 plus 99, which is 100. 2 plus 98 is 100. 3 plus 97 is 100. 100, 100, 100. x plus x is? No. 2x. How many hundreds did I write down here? Okay, I wrote down six. How many are there really? <laughs> no. Yeah, 99. I start, look, you just look at the top equation. Just look at the top equation. There is a... There's a 100 for every number listed in the first equation, right? The one to, there's a correspondence. The 1, 2, 3, yeah, 99. 99 100s. I have 99 of these. Okay, so 100 times 99 is 9900 is equal to 2x. 
Divide both sides by 2, so we get x is 4,950. Yeah, let's not do this. Skip. Yeah, we're going to come up with an equation, but you don't have to do that. We're going to skip it. So let's say we have an election with 10 candidates, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, and J. We're going to count the pairwise comparison. So I'm just going to have to write them out, right? So it's the only thing I can do so far. So I'm going to have A against B. A against C, A D, A E, A F, A G, A H, A I, and A J. So that's all of A's matchups. Now I'm going to write out all of B's matchups, but I already did B against A, so I start with B against C, B D, B E, B F. B G, B H, B I, B against J. Okay, so that's all B's matchups. Then we do C, but we already did C against B and C against A, so we have C D, C E, C F, C G, C H, C I, C J. Now we do D's matchups. We already did D against C, D against B, and D against A. So we start with D against E. E, J, right? And then we go on to E, E, F, E, G, E, H, E, I, E, J. Move on to F, F, G, F, H. F I, F J, move on to G, G H, G I, G J. Then we do uh, H's, H I, H J. Then we do I's, which is I J, and J is all done. Okay, so let's add them all up. <laughs> let's just add up all the A column. How many matchups are in this A column? Nine. How many matchups are in the B column? The C column? Seven, six, four, three, two, one. So there were 10 candidates, right? And to find the total number of matchups, I'm going to have to add 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7 plus 8 plus 9. So 1 plus 2 plus 3. So we could do our little trick, or you could just add them up, because this one isn't that many, right? So keep in mind, 10 candidates add up the numbers from 1 to 9, not 10. So this ends up being 45. So in general, to find out how many candidates are needed for an election with n candidates, you add the numbers from 1 to what? Nope. n minus 1. Yeah. When there were 10 candidates, you added the numbers from 1 to 9. So we're going to stop at 1 less than n, which is n minus 1. Wait, so you said add the number? Add the numbers from 1 to n minus 1. Doesn't matter. No. But we can if you want. <laughs> so we don't need a formula because we have a method to figure this out. No matter what the number of candidates is, we could write equals x, right, and figure out what the sum is by doing our little trick. See, how much do we have left here? One more example. 
So we have a, a round robin tournament. Every player plays every other player one time. Uh, imagine you're in charge of scheduling. There are 32 players. You get a dollar per match. How much will you make? So if there are 32 players, there's 31 matchups. Everyone has to get matched up against everyone else. Yeah. You add the numbers from 1 to 31. Okay. Yes. Yep. Would be double your number, right? So I write it out backwards. So I have 31 plus 30 plus 29 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1 also equals x. Add the equations together, so I have 32 plus 32 plus 32 plus 32 plus 32 plus 32, plus 32 is 2x. How many 32s are there all together? 31. Yep. So this is 31 times 32 equals 2x. Can somebody do 31 times 32 for me? Nine hundred ninety-two okay. equals two x. Divide both sides by two, so x is four hundred ninety-six matchups, which means that you're going to get paid four hundred ninety-six dollars. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. So do you use any number like Yes. And then divide it by two. Yeah. So yeah, if you want to have a formula right for N candidates or N matchups, right? For uh, and you need N candidates, you need to know how many matchups. You just do n times n minus 1 divided by 2. I like yes, yeah. sure. <laughs> yeah, for n candidates, there are this many matchups. Yeah, so some people like formulas. Some people, um, like me, I hate to memorize formulas, so I always write it out with the two equations. But you can just use the formula. 